By now, you've probably heard my magic wand story. It's a brand that's been part of my personal journey for more than 20 years. But no matter how many times I sing magic wands praises, I'll never be able to fully capture the story of this incredible brand. Well, now journalist and author Kate Sloan just completed a limited audio series documenting the history and impact that Magic Wand has created over the last 56 years. It's called Making Magic. And the series chronicles Magic Wand's incredible brand story through interviews with nearly 40 experts, performers, business owners, educators, and fans. So I got a sneak preview of the series. And what I loved is that Kate weaves together snippets from all their interviews into this amazing story arc. She covers Magic Wand's journey from a appliance store massager to its legendary influence on culture and sexual independence. And it's all just fascinating. The first episodes of Making Magic are available now at makingmagicseries.com or on all popular podcast platforms. Just search for Making Magic or visit makingmagicseries.com today. Thanks for listening to Sex with Emily. On today's show, I'm helping you communicate your way to better sex and relationships. Topics include the double oral sex standard, why men aren't always in the mood, and it might not be what you think, the hidden and sometimes surprising benefits of masturbation, a firsthand perspective, and ways to overcome your sexual insecurities. All this and more. Thanks for listening. Hey, Emily, you got a boyfriend? Because uh, my man E here, he just got his heart broken. He thinks you're kind of cute. The girl's got to have her standards. Oh, my. Do women know about shrinkage? Isn't it common knowledge? What do you mean, like laundry? It shrinks? Can we not talk about sex so much? Are you kidding me? Oh, my God, I feel so good. Being bad feels pretty good. But you know, Emily's not the kind of girl you just play with. You're listening to Sex with Emily. We're talking about sex, relationships, and everything in between. For more information, go to sexwithemily.com and follow us on all social media. It's at Sex with Emily. It feels like so commanding, like follow us and all. I mean, if you want to, if you're into it, if you happen to be scrolling through Instagram and you want to be inspired and you want to say hi, follow us on all those places. It's at Sex with Emily. So it's May. It's still Masturbation Month. How's it been going for you? We are having a contest, a Masturbation Month contest, and we actually extended it till June 18th. And I'm so glad we did because I'm actually getting a slow start on my Masturbation Month. I don't know about you, but if I can have a few more weeks to the masturbation plan, we did extend the contest to June 18th. We want to know how has masturbation benefited your life and your sex life? What has it done for you? We want to hear your most heroic, touching um, interesting, inspiring stories about masturbation. Feedback at sexwithelmy.com by June 18th. Speaking of the Masturbation Month contest, okay, I've got a masturbation story for you. <laughs> All right, so I've been having a few stressful few weeks and, you know, I mean, I guess there's always a lot of anxiety and stress going on and I, you know, typically, I have a lot of things in place to deal with anxiety Um, I exercise, I meditate, I masturbate. I was like, oh my God, I'm realizing I'm really anxious. I thought, I haven't masturbated in probably 10 days, maybe two weeks. I thought, oh, okay, well, maybe I need a little release here. That must be what it is. And so I I laid in my bed. I looked down to get a vibrator because as you guys know, my house is like filled with vibrators. The only thing is, I was one of the things when I was out of town for a few days is I amazingly had my house redone while I was gone, like redecorated and reorganized because the problem with my house is that it's, I had never taken the time to really organize everything and you open up every drawer in the house and there was like vibrators that had been gifted to me. There'd been like a drawers of used vibrators. There'd been my nightstands next to my bed of like 15 charged vibrators ready to go, like very organized. And I was like, and literally they're probably the only things in my house that are organized but they were gone. And I'm like, I don't have a vibrator in my house. This is amazing that this happened and I I need a vibrator. So I'm like, okay, but I know this is the right thing that I got to do. And they're in the, and I realized that they're in the garage and they're in the garage and I'm like naked. So I'm like, I'm not going to walk into the garage right now. I got to have a vibrator. It's like someone else looking for, I don't know, loose change in their house. Like that's how many vibrators I have. So I start opening up little drawers and I'm like looking around like there's got to be. And then I see it. I see this box by Unbound. You guys know I have a subscription box. 
And it was all wrapped up. And I was like, because I'm going to give it to somebody because I love our boxes. I'm like, okay, please. And I'm praying. I'm like, this has got to have a vibrator in it. Most of these goddamn boxes have a vibrator in it. So I open it up and thank God there was an ooh by Jeju, which I love. My heart opens for Jeju because one of my first favorite vibrators was a Jeju. So I found the vibrator. I uh, found some lube samples and it was amazing. I'm telling you. I was like, oh, release. I haven't had one. So just like you, I get it. I say this all the time too. Like I get why it's hard for women to make the time to masturbate. Because when you're so busy in life, you forget that it feels good. You forget that there's so many benefits. And, um, and we just think, oh, it's okay. I'm with my partner and I have orgasms that way. But no, you guys, masturbating when you are not in a relationship is just as important as when you're in a relationship. Because it's that time alone. It's self-loving. It's all about you and your body and your connection. So I'd missed it. So I did that. I was like, oh, feeling great. You know, it was like the clouds parted. My day felt a lot brighter. And I was just like happy. And I was like, I gotta rem- I, I'm with you. It's my job to talk to you about orgasms and masturbation. But even I, surrounded by vibrators or not surrounded by them, I still often, you know, need it to release. So then I got in the shower. I was getting ready for work. I was excited. And I just... I was thinking though, I was like, oh yeah, that was fun. I'm so glad I figured this out. And then I got, then I got a little angry. I started thinking about all these people in my life that I have either given vibrators to or we've gifted to. And they're just like, there's the people I've given them to. They're like, oh yeah, that sounds cool. I haven't quite gotten to it yet. Or I wasn't quite sure what to do with it. And then there's those other people. And this is what made me sad that say, oh, I don't need a vibrator. We don't have that problem. And I thought, when did vibrators get a bad rap? Like, like who, who, who started the anti-vibrator coalition? Okay, anti-guns, I totally understand that. But like, who decided that we shouldn't like vibrators and that they're going to, that they're bad for you, they're going to replace you, that somehow an orgasm that you have without a vibrator, with your fingers, is somehow inferior, is somehow superior to an orgasm that you'd have with a vibrator. And I was thinking like, a lot of this has to do with, I think that, men are fearful of being replaced, that their penis is going to be replaced by something. So God, you know, if this vibrator comes into the picture, that's going to, you know, that's just going to, our relationship's going to be over. And as I've told you, like, and as hopefully you realize, a vibrator doesn't cuddle, can't take you to dinner. And a vibrator also just makes things a lot different. It's a variety. I think a lot of us crave variety in relationships. And so I just got upset that people are like classifying orgasms in different ways that you you can experience pleasure as like there's only way to go is like with your hands or through intercourse, which as we know, only 30% of women, if that, have orgasms during intercourse. And then I think about the people who are just like, nope, if I use a vibrator, I'm going to get addicted to it, which again, it's not a thing if you're having orgasm and pleasure. Now, I'm not telling you you have to use a vibrator every single time. So sometimes... I live close to my office and sometimes I want to walk to work because when you walk to work, you know, I can see the outdoors, I'm walking, I talk on the phone and sometimes I drive to work and sometimes I'll even Uber to work if I know I have an event after. But the point is all different ways. I still get to the office. The same goal is accomplished. I get to work. I'm productive. I'm doing, I'm working, but I, I got there and it's all, it doesn't matter how I got there. So the same thing is I still got there. The same result. I had a great day at work. If you have an orgasm and you experience pleasure, does it matter if it came through fingers or tongue, you know, or your mouth or with a toy? It's all pleasure. So I just feel like this is another way. I just want you guys to take another look. I'm not like being a pusher. I'm just saying if you have these weird notions in your head that like there's something wrong with using a toy and we got to still bring it out from hidden, you know, under the bed or something. No, I say like put your vibrator and that lube on every nightstand because that's my dream. So happy masturbation once to you. Um, I think you should uh, get on it. End of rant. It's kind of sex in the news. <laughs> So recently, you guys, DJ Khaled revealed, or the story got picked up, that in 2015, he admitted in an interview that he doesn't perform oral sex on his wife because there are different rules for men. He explains, you got to understand, we the king, there's just some things y'all might not want to do, but it got to get done. I just can't do what you want me to do. I just can't. So he's basically saying that, you know, I get it. Like I, he's like saying he doesn't love oral sex. He doesn't want to go down on his wife because he comes in and say like, I'm taking care of the house and the bills and whatever he says why later. And this is, this article is interesting because it breaks down actually the history of oral sex. DJ Khaled was not the first guy to say this. Freud 
theorize that men are terrified of the vulva because they subconsciously fear it will castrate them, which by the way, it will not. It will not castrate you. So attitudes in non-Western cultures have been different. So in in, uh, China, Taoism taught that ingesting vaginal secretions would strengthen the yang or the male essence, which is obviously true. And the Kama Sutra was very clear that the more orgasms you give to women, the better. And this fear of the penis being replaced or not enough is very palpable throughout all these things, even with the descent towards the vibrator. People don't love the vibrators. I think that there's this fear that your penis is not enough and that maybe your mouth isn't even enough or that your mouth is threatening your penis. And jokes that the vulva is dirty have a very long history. So the Romans considered the word clitoris an obscenity. So why why do we do oral sex? Well, evolutionarily speaking, oral sex serves no procreative function. And there've been many theories as to what's driving the behavior. Like why do we want to have oral sex if we can't have babies? Which is why a lot of our sexual behaviors are driven um, evolutionarily speaking. And they think that maybe when a man went down on a woman, they were thinking that he's hunting for another man's sperm. And I've heard all these things about men. The tip of your penis is actually shaped, thus it can pull out sperm, you know, like our from our ancestors. Like the cavemen would come home and from killing you know, wild boar, and then he'd use the tip of his penis and he'd have sex with a woman to pull out sperm. Have you guys heard that one as well? So, but here we are today in 2018, and I don't even know why there's a debate about oral sex. Why is there a debate about oral sex? Why is there a debate about vibrators? Why is there even a debate about squirting? I think it's funny. Even the G-spot, all this stuff that we know feels amazing and benefits so many people and that we all love like that I'm actually speaking to you that people are debating it when we know that it feels so goddamn good. But, and I'm not bashing guys here at all. You guys know that my heart, I love, love, love men and I'm just here to help you. There are so many women out there that don't typically like to give blowjobs either. So I understand this is an equal opportunity oral ditching zone. So what I found about oral sex is that it comes down to the worry that we're just not good enough. So I think there's women who say they don't like oral because they just feel like they don't know what they're doing and they don't know that they're doing it right. And same with guys. And I think that women are much more in touch with, or from what I hear from women, they're like afraid I'm not going to be good enough. And from guys, I feel that there's many men who's like, nope, that's not my thing. I'm not going to do it because perhaps once they were told they weren't good at it or their partners doesn't seem to be pleased by it. So they just stop altogether. And they don't even remember that time that it happened where they did, where they were told that they weren't doing a good job. And this goes for men and for women. So that's like one, that's like one camp. And then there's a camp of men and women who I think really just don't like it. Like they just don't like doing it. You know, maybe you don't like the taste or you had a bad experience. But if that is the case, when you're like, yeah, there's just something about it and I'm not sure, talk to your partner about it. Communicate that I'm not sure what it is, but I really want to please you, babe. And um, and and maybe give yourself a benefit of the doubt. Maybe it is that you don't know, like you haven't really performed oral on someone to success or what success looks like in your book. But if that's the case, you guys, then talk to your partner about it. Just say, you know, babe, I've been feeling like I really want to perform oral. I know that that's something you're into. How can I do it better? How could I please you? And really your partner can can show you. You guys can do the whole mutual masturbation thing. But my challenge here was around DJ Cal that he just declares like, no, I'm the king and men should not perform oral sex, but expects that they should get a blowjob in return. And that's just furthering the double standard. And it's kind of a cop out. If his wife is cool with it, that's fine. But I just feel like he's missing out. And I think that that to really learn how to please your partner, whatever that takes and whatever that looks like, that once you really get there, because it takes work, you guys, real great sex takes work, that it'll be so satisfying. And I think that you'll forget that you might have had doubts about oral or anything else with sex. That's why I think every new partner is a new chance to co-create a new relationship and a new sex life. That's what I got to say about oral and DJ Khaled. Lest you think that I'm just bashing the men of the world, my next Sex of the News is a study that just came out, which has been picked up everywhere. It says that men are put off by sex due to pressure to perform, study says. So if the stereotype is to be believed, it's women who feign a headache and turn to their spouse with the words, not tonight, dear. But research suggests that it's actually men who are often responsible for the lack of sex in a marriage because they feel under pressure to perform. A review of 64 studies into couples' love lives found that men are put off by the sex and the expectation they'll make the first move. And my head almost exploded when I read this because I was like, 
One of the first myths that was busted or that shocked me when I started the show was finding out that actually I believed it. I believed that women were a little more timid or frigid and that men were the ones who always wanted sex. And this is a, such a common belief. And my head was also about to explode because I was like, oh, wow, I hear from men a lot. And you guys email me. You're like, why won't my partner initiate? Why won't my partner initiate? But this takes it to a whole nother level. Like, it makes sense that you'd want your partner to initiate. I mean, men, again, this is where my heart is wide and open and you know, every woman's different the way she orgasms. You guys have to make the first move oftentimes. Women are expecting you to make the plans for the date. I mean, that is a lot of pressure. But what I, what I see here is that like, you want your partners to, but you're asking me for her, to, for her or him to initiate more sex is because you're like, I'm actually worried that it's a whole thing for me to initiate because then I worry, am I going to perform? Am I going to please her? Maybe you feel like, you know, you haven't been getting along lately because the study goes on to say that just like women, here's another myth, a lack of emotional connection or fear that their partner finds them unattractive may also turn them off from a night of passion. So it's not just the women who are worried about their looks and what they're doing in the bedroom, but men are equally as worried, which I know because I talk to all of you, but to see it here in a study that shows that, yep, it's equal opportunity here for men and women to put efforts into the relationship for initiating for talking about what you need, for talking about how you even initiate sex and perform, and to kind of take the pressure off your partner. I just think it's interesting that they show that the emotional connection is important for both halves of the couple. And there there are these assumptions, you guys, in our culture that women have a lower sexual desire than men, and it's abnormal for women to have a high sexual desire or for men to have low sexual desire. So research, this isn't the first study, you guys, but in recent years, it's shown that these gender-based assumptions about sexual desire are not supported by the data. And last night, I was at a dinner party, an all-women dinner party, and, you know, as typical when someone finds out what I do, this woman said, oh, I, um, she's in her 30s, mid-30s, and she just got married, and she says, it's so weird. She said, I've always wanted more sex. They've just got married, but been together eight years, and she said, I just feel bad because I feel that I always want more sex than him, and that something's, that she feels like the sex crazed person, and that he just feels broken because he doesn't want it as much as he does because we're told that men should, you know, be always initiating, and That's why you really just do need to talk about in your relationship, like who's going to initiate? Like, I think that's the other thing that there's a lot of women I hear from who think, I don't even really know how. It doesn't feel right to me. But don't blame yourself because this study also says, you guys, and I think we know that society in general put the pressure on men to initiate sex. Even men feel this, even when they don't want sex, they feel they have to initiate. They worry they won't have erotic feelings or they will fail to perform. And this can create a negative feedback loop, which can ruin their love life. They feel like they have to initiate. They don't want to. They're not ready because they want to talk as well. We all want to talk about our feelings and emotions. So my advice for both sexes and in this article is to understand you guys that sexual desire in a relationship will ebb and flow. It's always going to be flipping around in a relationship. Even, you know, someone might want it more than the other. And even if you always kind of are the one person who wants it a little bit more than your partner, that's fine. You just have to work within the confines of your relationship. So if you can get rid of the assumption that men have higher sex drives and something's wrong, if they don't, I think that um, you guys would be able to really kind of start from a level playing field in your relationship and say, what do we both want? And again, I've talked a lot about initiating sex. If you're in a relationship right now and you're like, yeah, you know what, Emily, I hear you. I'm going to go home tonight and I'm going to initiate, damn it. I'm going to do it. Um, But then I think you get to the front door and you're like, God, what do I do? I think it might be good for you to, instead of just pressuring yourself into doing it and feeling bad, if it's not, if that hasn't worked yet, say to your partner, What does it look like for you, me, you coming home and initiating sex? Because I think sometimes we just need more clarification. So your partner might say, well, you walk in the door and you drop your knees and you give me a blowjob. Or you, you walk in the door and we have dinner and then you, you know, you, I don't know, put my hands back in handcuffs. So you blindfold me. Who knows? Your partner may have a really clear sense of what it it might just be like, lean over and kiss me. And I know that's going to be initiation. I think we create this thing in our head that, oh my God, initiating sex. I got to roll out the sport sheets and I got to bring out the sex toys and the bells and the whistles and the, the, the sun has to be setting and we have to have fresh lobster. I don't know what you think, but for a lot of people, you're going to find out that it's literally turning towards your partner, giving them that look and giving him a kiss. And then, whoop, sex is off to the races. So I hope that this is inspiring everyone to go and have some awesome sex tonight. Okay, we're going to take a quick break, give a shout out to our sponsors, and when we come back, we're going to get into your emails. We're on to your emails. I love answering your questions. It's why... 
I do what I do. If you'd like to question answered on the show, you can text Ask Emily, all one word to 797979. Fill out the short form or go to my website, sexwithemily.com. Click on the Ask Emily tab and include your name, your age, where you live, and how you listen to the show. All right. This is from Aaliyah, 26 in Washington. Hi, Emily. So my husband and I have only been married for two years, but we recently had a baby. We don't have a lot of time to have sex, so it's always a quickie. My husband hates performing oral sex, but still wants me to. I'm bisexual, and there are oftentimes he just wants to have someone join us, but I'm just too jealous for that. How do I spice up our love life and get him to perform oral sex or foreplay? And how do I shut him down about the threesome without hurting his feelings? Okay, Leah, this there's a lot going on here. Um, but first, let me get this straight. Let me play this back to you. You just had a baby. You, you gave birth to like a human being came out of your vagina. You carry or you had a C-section. I'm not sure. But you had a baby. You carried a child for nine months. And he's asking you for blowjobs and wants to outsource it to another woman who he might also disappoint because he doesn't want to go down on her. Um, you guys, I mean, you had a baby, sweetie. So I feel like, a, and in fact, what I tell a lot of couples is you might just not be ready yet for sex and you might just need some foreplay. In fact, my recipe, if you guys came to see me, I would say, you know what? I think you got to give Aaliyah some foot rubs, some intimacy, you know, some back rubs, some oral. Like, I think this is the time when you got to get off your feet and you need some some love and some pampering. So you guys have been together for two years. And I think that this is just some a conversation you have to have with him because he does it. He hates oral sex and wants to be with someone else. And you want to spice it up. Have you guys ever talked about your sex life? It sounds like things have moved really quickly. So if you've been together two years and you already have a baby, I'd say for a year of it, you've been pregnant and now you have a child. So I think you have to rewind to the to the very basic sex talk here and you got to have this conversation with him straight up. I mean, you are telling me that he hates performing oral. So I'm just going to assume that he has said those exact words to you. Because remember, sometimes we put words in our partner's mouth. Maybe one time he said it's not his thing or he hasn't had experiences. But what you're saying is he hates it. So if he actually said it, you could say, babe, I actually love oral sex. It feels really good. Can you tell me a little about what you hate about it? So he might say, you know, the taste. Well, you know, you could use flavored lubes. You can make sure that you guys shower. I mean, I'm not going to debate on that. If he's got some kind of challenges around, you know, oral, I just think there's ways around it. This is your husband. So you could give him options. If it's that he doesn't, he's not sure that he's pleasing you. I mean, I've heard crazier things. He might say, oh, I do it all the time, but it seemed like you didn't like it for all you know. Couples have very different experiences in the same relationship. So if he's like, well, I'm just not sure what you want. I tried a few times. Men get they can have short fuses around the stuff like like we've talked about. So a little mutual masturbation could be great. If he's like, I'm not sure what you like, the two of you, you know, you touch yourself, he touches himself, and you figure out so you can get your oral sex. I don't think that you in any way need to give up oral sex in this relationship or your pleasure. You can also get a toy. Just make sure that you're getting yours because as I said, having orgasms are so important whether you're in a relationship, out of a relationship, and definitely after you had a child, I think some orgasms would be amazing for you if you're not already masturbating. And then as for the assumption that you are bisexual and that he wants someone else to join, especially right now when if you just had a baby, I'm assuming you're not really in the mood for entertaining or to have a threesome. So I, I don't know if you guys like arrange something around this or he assumes this is going to be like a monthly thing, but if you're not, you know really ready to have a threesome right now, I would tell him that that's something that's put on hold for a while. So this is when you speak up as the mom and the wife and the woman who has very, very specific needs um, that are requirement are required to be met and either he's in or he's out. So I think that there's um, that less worrying about his feelings and more worrying about getting your message across to getting what you need in bed. This is from Emma, 22, Australia. Hi, Emily. I've been with my boyfriend for eight years. He's amazing and we have regular sex. It feels good, but I've never orgasmed. My boyfriend tries to go down on me and do things for me even when he's had an orgasm. He's always willing to keep going on me, but I never feel comfortable enough to be pleasure alone because I know I either won't like it or even if I do, he'll be going forever before anything is even close to an orgasm. I also don't masturbate because I don't think it feels good. I've tried with toys too, but I just get over it after a few minutes. It's almost like I begin to climax and then when I'm about to orgasm, everything fizzles out and I lose interest. Thoughts? Okay, Emma, this is a great question. I think you sound just like how I felt about your age. I wasn't really sure either about sex and what felt good, but this is really all about you. Happy Masturbation Month. This is the perfect month to do it and taking the time to just go for it, to figure out your body. There is no quick fix here. 
um, you have to put in the time. But you guys, this is fun. Like I'm telling you, Emma, that you should try to, you know, go to bed a little earlier or wake up in the morning a little earlier or just take a quick break. It take 20 minutes, 30 minutes by yourself without the goal of orgasm, just touching yourself and f- realizing like where your erogenous zones are. How do you orgasm? What makes you feel good? And um, you said that you used a toy for a few minutes. Well, maybe you need to go in a lower setting or some for some women, a vibrator can be a little strong at the beginning. You can use it over your underwear. Try some lube. I mean, the reason why we don't all orgasm so easily is because we're all different. So we literally have, it's an inside job. We literally have to do this on our own. So I can give you all the tools. I can give you a lot of suggestions, but Emma, you're the only one that's going to be able to figure it out. And I think you're also really in your head about this too. So you're already going into sex with this notion and masturbation that nothing feels good and nothing's going to work, which I can also relate to kind of having that tape in your head that plays back all these things. But remember, they're not true. So the next time you sit down with yourself or with your partner, just try to be present and focus and breathe and like focus on your breath and the sensations you're feeling in your body. And anytime you have those thoughts that are defeatist and it's not going to happen, just watch them go past you and go back to your breath and what you're feeling in the moment, whether it's in masturbation or connecting with your partner. And also it's okay that this is a journey towards orgasm. You're not wrong. Um, We don't have to fix you. Nothing is broken. All I'm asking you to do is take some time, some self-loving in your bedroom to um, figure out your body. And this is going to be good. And you're going to love it. You're welcome. Let me know how it goes. Thanks, Emma. This is Daniel who wrote me on Instagram, which again, I love hearing from you everywhere. You guys can message me on Instagram, but best to do it through the website. But Daniel, hey, Emily. So here's a few questions that came up while listening to your incredible podcast. Number one, is it weird for a guy to moan louder than a chick during sex? I've been told that it's not very masculine to be louder than her. Number two, what are your thoughts on chicks eating a guy's ass? I've had that happen to me twice with different girls and it felt amazing, but I'm a little ashamed to talk about it. Number three, should I be ashamed that I prefer a girl take control during sex? I also take control, but I like it when she knows what she wants and isn't shy about taking the reins. As you can tell, there's a common theme with my questions. Thanks again for taking the time to answer and keep slaying it. Okay, Daniel, these are all great questions. Yes, there is a common theme here. And the common theme I understand is that you want to know, are you normal? Is it okay that you're experiencing things that society has maybe set up aren't typically, or what you've heard from your friends aren't typically the male role? So let's break this down. So is it weird for a guy to moan louder than a chick during sex? I've been told it's not masculine to be louder than her. Where did you hear this? I've never even heard that. I mean, I think that it's really hot to just be loud and express yourself when you orgasm and to do you. Because that's the last thing we all need to be thinking is, how do I sound? What does my face look like when I orgasm? So I think if you're feeling it, be loud. Um, Do your thing. Make your noises. My thoughts on chicks eating guys' ass? My thoughts are yes. And especially because you've had it happen to you twice and it felt amazing. There's so many nerve endings and there's so much to play with, you know, and our, our anus. So I say, yes, go for it. And you got to get rid of that shame, honey. Shame holds so many of us back from having the sex we want. We prejudge ourselves and we stop ourselves from having experiences. So um, I don't think that if you're with someone, you could just say, I think it'd be really hot if you lick my ass. Let's take a shower. Or what do you think about that? Or anal play turns me on. Does that turn you on? I mean, guys, I know I try to make it a lot easier, but sometimes just say it. Like, just ask the question. It's better than not asking. And as long as you do it in a, in a tone that's not accusatory, like, why don't you ever lick my ass? And you're like, God, ass play is really fun for me. What about you? There, you did it, you said it, and you're getting your needs met. So that's my thing about anal licking. I think anal licking, 2017, I think was the year of anal licking. And it just, it's going strong. Men and women, they're all over it. Um, should I be ashamed that I prefer a girl take control during sex? I also take control. No, I mean, there's no shame. You should not be shamed. You shouldn't be worried that you're not normal here. Um, I'm going to tell you, no, don't be shamed and ask for what you want. There's a lot of people who switch. They like to be dominant. They like to be submissive. And I think that you're going to find a woman who's just dying to dominate you. And the sooner that you speak this to your partner that you're going to have sex with, that you're having sex with, the sooner you're going to be dominated. So how about that? All I'm telling you is, Daniel, you have my okay to go out into the world and ask for all these things and have incredible sex. And the only thing stopping you is you talking about it. Thanks, Daniel. I want to hear about all this. This is from Gilbert43 in New York. Dear Emily, do women really want to be approached anytime and anywhere? 
laundromat, park, supermarket. After a date, is it okay to just ask if she wants to have sex? Also, is it true that women are more open to casual sex? I ask this because of the hashtag Me Too movement. I'm a nice guy. I'm just lonely in life. I need physical touch. Oh, God, we all need physical touch. I totally understand that, Gilbert. So this is a really important question, especially in the wake of all the the Me Too. And I feel like um, it makes sense that you might be a little confused right now about women want and thinking twice, which I think isn't a bad thing that a lot of men are kind of fearful if they've maybe been appropriate in the past. And I feel for you because all we're getting now is a lot of criticism about men and what they're doing, what they did wrong, but we're not getting a roadmap for how to move forward. So as far as you approaching women, it's totally fine to approach a woman wherever, you know, strike up a conversation. If you just approach a woman and you're not creepy and you just start talking to her because you're both waiting for your laundry to dry and then you strike up a conversation and you think she's attractive and you ask her out, I wouldn't lead with, hey, you want to go have sex? I, I just, I would just try to like, have a conversation and see if you actually like this person, if she's into you too. I think as long as you're mindful in your approach and you're more focused on a guy that she likes and someone she wants to hang out with rather than just saying, hey, do you want to have sex? Um, That's what I would say about talking and approaching women. When I've, most of the guys I've met and that I've dated, I've met in real life. Like I've met them at a conference or at a restaurant or walking down the street, literally. So it wasn't like they had some magic pickup line. They were just cool guys and I started talking to them. And no, it's not because they looked a certain way or anything else. It's like for me and for a lot of women, if a guy approaches you with confidence and he makes you feel safe and you have a good conversation, um, you're pretty much going to be able to meet a lot of people that way. And I also understand that it takes practice. So Gilbert, this might make you a little nervous, but the more you just talk to women without even the goal of like wanting to sleep with them, I promise you this will make life so much easier for you and probably um, just easier to find women and talk to women. You'll probably make a lot more friends this way as well. Because even if a woman decides she doesn't want to sleep with you, she might have a really cute friend. And as far as, is it okay just to ask her if she wants to have sex? I mean, let me ask you this. I mean, think about it. If you're just like had a great day and you guys are leaving the restaurant or whatever you did and you're walking down the street and you just said, hey, you want to have sex? I mean, I know if a guy said that to me, we were having a great day and he's like, want to have sex? I'd probably go running away. I'd be like, oh, I'm peace out. It's off-putting. It's going to be kind of jarring when we're just getting along and we're talking. So I would say no, that could be very weird and awkward for a woman. And the best thing to do is just kind of gauge how you guys are, you know, uh, connecting to each other. Is there chemistry? You know, do you want to kiss her? Like, I'd much rather have a makeout session and then kind of we're both getting into it and then we kind of know where it's going to go next rather than just abruptly saying, let's go have sex. So I think that what we're talking about here is a little bit of you slowing down and practicing talking to women and talking to people and making connections. Because once you make authentic connections with people and it's not just about sex and it's not just about like curing your loneliness because we can all smell desperation, okay? It's an ugly, ugly cologne. We can smell it, men and women, we put it out there. But the more that you practice talking to people or just having a fuller life and a community around you, you're going to be so much, um, you're going to be such a better place to meet more people and more confident in your skin and It'll make life a lot easier and you probably won't have the same questions about escalating towards sex. Because the truth is, once you're in the space of of truly being yourself, being authentic, being confident and coming from a place of strength, you're not going to be wondering what comes next, what comes next, because it'll just flow, which is what happens um, when people have a real connection and chemistry. It's a flow. So that's why I think you got some work cut out for you. But this is fun, Gilbert. I'm telling you to go out and talk to women and get into a good groove with yourself. This is from Chris. She's 37 in Florida. Dear Emily, my boyfriend watches porn while he's at work. I've noticed recently that he's been looking at porn with teen or virgin stepdaughter or schoolgirl and things like that. It concerns me because we have five daughters in our home. The oldest is 19 and not his. Is this something that I should be concerned by? Um, This is just the latest in a long line of things. I don't know what to do anymore. Please help. Um, Chris, okay. If you're asking me, I'm just going to take a guess here that you're concerned because I'm concerned too. Yes, I think we should be concerned. Not like we'll get to the girls, the five daughters in your house for a minute, but he watches porn while he's at work. 
Like, what kind of job does he have? So he's watching porn at work. That's one thing. And you're noticing that he's looking at porn with teen or virgin stepdaughters. And you have had other things that go have gone in your house that are giving you concern. So I would say that the porn is a symptom, maybe, of some other things that are happening, of his disregard, perhaps. Well, number one for rules, if he's masturbating at work. Um, although, I am i don't know. I'm not in, well, I was going to say I'm not in Florida. Florida is part of the United States. Um, but I think that, uh, yeah, this sounds like you just have to have some talks with him because um, I might be a little concerned about my daughters. And if there's been some other signs, I'm not saying that, um, you know, it's very common for men to watch young teen porn, I think is really common. But I feel like, again, this is a symptom of some deeper challenges in your relationship. So rather than going after this um, and say, why are you looking at porn? Are you going to do something to our daughters, my daughters? Um, I think that you guys need to have the talk about your sex life and your relationship and the things that are happening, Chris, your relationship, the latest and long line of things. I would write all those things down and see what the common theme is in there. It's probably something about, I don't know what, I'm just going to guess. Um, it could be disrespect. It could be that he's not willing to compromise. It could be that he's, you know, not showing love or not showing caring or you don't feel safe. But I'm sure that all of the things have a very common denominator that are being exuded by your boyfriend. And I think those are the things that you should really take a look at. And it's probably not necessarily only about this porn, but I would have this conversation sooner than later, Chris. And I think that you know this and that's why you emailed me and I'm so glad you did. And I hope the second you hear this, that you um, start having these talks. I hope when you hear this, you have that com- this conversation right now. Thank you, Chris. Okay, guys, thank you for a fun show. Thank you for listening to the show. And um, don't forget to send in your masturbation routines by June 18th. I hope I've inspired you guys to um, pick up the habit again, to make it part of your life. And um, I love hearing from you. And I just love you all. Thanks for listening. Thanks to my amazing team, Ken, Jenny, Volunteer, Sarah, Producer Jamie, and Michael. Was it good for you? Email me, feedback at sexwithemily.com. <laughs>